Okay, this is the part B2 of the June 2013 Regents. And this is the free response section where you have a booklet that we're going to add to as we go further. So let's begin. Based on your answers to question 50, base your answers to questions 51 to 53 on the information below and your knowledge of chemistry. Imagine that. Okay. So what I like to tell my students at this point is go look at the questions first. I have so many people who read these blurbs. They've just done 50 multiple choice questions or maybe a little tired. And they read these blurbs first because teachers say read these little blurbs. And then they get all, I don't know, intimidated sometimes. Now some people say read them first. You do what your teacher says. But my opinion is here, look at the question. They want you to balance in your answer booklet. Okay, so let's go to our booklet. If you are in an answer booklet, because anything written in the test is not going to be graded. So here's my reaction. Um, sad, happy reaction. No, it's a terrible joke. But I have one magnesium, three magnesium. So I put a three in front. Remember, I can't change the chemical formulas. Just put these coefficients in front. I have already have two. So you don't have to put anything in front. Or you could put one. Nothing in front implies one. If I have an apple... I don't have to say I have one apple. So nothing in front of the N2 means one already. So just if you put one there or not, it is balanced. That was not so challenging, I don't think. So in any case, 51 is that. 52 in the ground state, which noble gas has atoms with the same electron configuration as the magnesium ion? All right. So the magnesium, that's a good question. What is the magnesium ion? Well, an atom of magnesium has the same number of protons as uh, electrons. It's atomic number 12. So it starts out with 12 protons and 12 electrons. But the point I'm trying to say is what is the ion form of magnesium? So let's go to the periodic table. So we look for magnesium. It's an alkaline earth metal. Let's get up close and personal with magnesium to see what ion it likes to become and it likes to become a plus two ion which makes sense it loses its two valence electrons to have the same configuration as 2-8 which is the noble gas it wants to try to achieve which is the same as um, argon so mag oops I think I made a mistake there magnesium 2-8 would be neon right so magnesium had a configuration of 2-8-2, so it's easier for it to lose two to achieve the same configuration, not the same element, the same electron arrangement as neon. Don't know why I keep wanting to go to argon. Okay. So number 52, we put neon. Good for me. Number 53. Explain in terms of electrons why an atom of the metal in this reaction forms an ion that has a smaller radius than its atom. Okay, well it makes an ion, which is, this is the magnesium atom, becomes an ion that's Mg plus 2, as we've seen in the periodic table, when it gives off two electrons as it, quote, oxidizes. Now, its radius is smaller than the atom. So here's the atom, magnesium is big, it loses two electrons to become smaller. So in terms of electrons, Y has a smaller radius. And you could say, very simply, it loses two electrons. That would be totally acceptable. But let's write this in the answer booklet. You could say magnesium loses two valence electrons and because the ion loses all of its third shell electrons, the 
ion gets smaller. Now, of course, magnesium is 2-8-2. It's got two electrons in the third energy level, eight in the second and two in the first. The third is not filled, but when it loses all of these, you lose an entire shell, and the shells fill from close to far away. So losing two electrons and losing a whole shell makes this smaller. Also, you could say, another example, another way to say it, you could say also the um, remaining electrons feel the nucleus, the nucleus or the nuclear charge, that's the pull of the protons, more. Okay, so there's many ways to say that. Um, believe it or not, I believe they would accept just losing two electrons. Is, is enough, but uh, I would say lose two electrons and because you're losing what? An outermost shell, you get smaller. I like the answer is the remaining electrons feel the nucleus more as that second shell is closer or there is more protons to um, electron ratio. Whatever works for you. Number 54, identify the type of chemical bond, the molecule of the reactant. Now you should know the reactants react chemically to make the what? The products. So this is the product side, and this is the reactant side. So O2, by a Lewis dot diagram, has six valence electrons, and another oxygen has six valence electrons. And in order to satisfy the octet rule, and, and feel like they're filling their second energy level, which has a maximum of eight, they would need a dull bond. But this idea of sharing electrons to become stable because they both have high attraction is a covalent bond, okay, or a polar covalent bond. Many things they accept here. So let's go to the booklet. So O2 is, could be a covalent bond. You could say it's a nonpolar covalent bond. You could say it's a double bond. Maybe molecular bond if you're describing something um, that's between two nonmetals. Many different possibilities all have to be right, of course. Number 55. Number 55 in your space in your answer booklet, draw a Lewis dot diagram for one oxygen atom. Okay, you have to do what they say. If you drew what I did here, that's not an atom, that's a molecule, well, it's an element, molecular oxygen, okay, or elemental oxygen. So 55, an atom of one oxygen atom. All right, Lewis dot diagram for one oxygen atom. I can do this. So I start with oxygen. It's got six valence electrons, and these valence electrons surround the atom and I can't count so I got six and however you want to uh, draw this I'm just gonna draw another one as long as you show six valence electrons or six dots you're good they just wanted an atom so a Lewis dot diagram the dots represent valence electrons okay and you just show six dots and how do I know it has six valence let's go to the correct table so oxygen is 2-6 or 16, 2 fills the first, 6 does not fill the second, so that 6 is valence. That's why we draw oxygen with 6 dots. If you had fluorine, you'd have 7 dots. Niogen, although it doesn't have any valence, or neon I should say, doesn't have any valence, you would draw the 8 dots to show that it's completely filled in its second energy level. Number 56, explain in terms of bonds why energy is absorbed during the reaction. So we're explaining terms of bonds. You must pay particular uh, attention to how they want you to answer this. Okay, so 
Why energy is absorbed during this reaction? Well, if you notice, we have O2 breaking apart into individual molecular or elemental oxygen here. I uh, probably shouldn't say neither, into oxygen atoms. Okay, so a molecule is broken up into atoms. So we're breaking this double bond here. So why is it endothermic? Why do I need energy to make this happen? Well, the, um, the idea here is that bonds between atoms are there to increase stability. Oxygen, as we've talked about, is 2-6. So it barely wants to fill this outermost valence cell of electrons into 2-8, and that would make it stable. Now, stable, as we've talked about, if you've been with me throughout this test, means low energy. Whereas, in this case, 2-6 is unstable. This has high energy. And things with high energy want to move to low energy. So this energy is high. Oxygen atoms are not found in nature like this because they are unstable. They're high energy. They're going to do something. And what they would do is they would find each other and they would collide and create a double bond. And they would create a double bond because by sharing a pair of each electron pair with each other, they would have two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They would both feel like they're two dash eight. And the driving force is stability here. So if you are stable with low energy bonded, and this is low energy, to become free atoms, you have high energy. Bonding is just a way to use each other's electrons to achieve stabi stability or low, uh, low, or low energy. So bonded atoms have that low energy. And if you're going to go from the bonded atom to the free atoms, you need to go up in energy. And how do you go up? Well, you're going to need energy. And that's why the energy is written there. To break a bond, energy is always required. It's essentially the answer they're looking for. And the opposite is also important because they can ask this the opposite way. If I have two oxygen atoms coming together, okay, to make O2, this would be exothermic. Energy would be released. So if you're starting with free atoms, in the case of my second example, we'll change the color. So look at example. So I start with free atoms, and I go to the bonded state. I'd have to go down in energy. Therefore, energy would have to be released. But in the example they gave you, you're going from the bonded state to the free state. So let's go to the booklet. So all you have to say here is the energy is needed to break the bonds. in O2. Really, it's all you need. You don't have to explain everything there, but you basically you need energy to disrupt a very stable scenario, which is the bonds between the atoms of oxygen. Just that's all they need. Okay. So in number 57, we have the heating curve for water, and they're starting me at negative, negative 25, and we're finishing at 125. Being at standard um, pressure, it screams to me that um, we're going to have temperatures that are reflective of the temperatures that we know that water boils at. 100 would be the boiling point. That's a liquid going to a gas. And then here we have a solid going to a liquid. Of course, that is going to be melting. And that, of course, is at zero. Now, you should know that the, uh, the, phase, the phases on this graph is you go from A to B, it's all in the solid phase. From C to D is all in the uh, liquid phase. And from E to F is all in the gas phase. I say gas because gas has tremendous energy. So you should be able to know these parts of the graph pretty solidly for this question or any other question. Let's get to the questions. Number 57, describe what happens to both the potential energy and the average kinetic energy of the molecules during interval AB. Well, AB, we're starting with a solid below its melting point, negative 25. 
and at B, it starts to change its phase. But we're going to say from A to B, all right, the potential energy and the average kinetic energy has to change. And you may say, well, I know that the temperature is going to increase. Obviously, we're going from negative 25 to zero. Temperature, you have to know this cold, is average kinetic energy. That's important you understand that. That's the motion energy, thermal motion. So that is the kinetic energy. So clearly, kinetic energy is going to increase here because the temperature is going up. The molecules that are in their fixed positions are going to vibrate more in the, during this interval. But you have to understand these questions you must answer according to how they want you to answer. So describe what happens to both the potential energy. Now, potential energy is not measured with a thermometer. It is not a measure of thermal or motion. Okay, it's a measure of other types of energies. Now, potential, think with me for a second. As the temperature is increasing from negative 25 to zero, and as the molecules in a fixed crystal lattice, and that's what happens in a solid, they're in a crystal, um, they're in a crystal structure, a regular three-dimensional arrangement, as they vibrate more and more in their fixed positions, don't they have more potential, okay, to move out of those positions the more energy you give them? And the answer would be yes. As you add heat, and we're doing that at a constant motion, how do I know? Well, the temperature is going up for the most part when you have pure phases. So we're adding heat to this system. And my friends in chemistry, anytime you add energy to a system, yes, the kinetic energy could go up if it's a pure phase, like it is for A and B, but also the potential energy has to go up. If you were to give my four-year-old candy and a tremendous amount of sugar, the potential for him to act out and act a little more uh, crazier with all that extra sugar running through his blood is increased. You give something more energy, the potential for them to do something with that has to increase, if you want to think with me that way. So let's go to the answer booklet. So the kinetic energy, I'm just going to abbreviate, increases and the potential energy increases at interval AB. Nice to write full sentences, even though I abbreviated. Number 58. Number 58 states, using the graph, determine the total amount of heat added to the sample during interval CD. All right, well, interval CD, we have another pure phase, and that's the liquid phase. Okay, and this liquid phase they want to know the total energy change. Now, we don't have to use Q equals MC change in T here, okay? Now, they could have set that problem up that way if we knew the mass of our sample, okay? We could do that, but it's not necessary because they're telling me heat is being what? Added, and they're looking for, in this case, they're looking for, uh, they're not saying, they said total amount of heat, so we'll, use, we'll keep it in kilojoules. So from C to D, let's see what we have here. Well, um, I know it looks like it's going by 4, so this is 4, so this is 8. Okay, this is 16. Looks like we're starting before that 8, so halfway between 4 and 8 would be a 6, and halfway between that would be a 7, so I'm saying we're at a 7, and we're going to go all the way up. Now, this would be 16. Looks like this would be a a little bit more than halfway or halfway well between 12 and 16 okay that's a 4 so that's a 4 in between a 12 and 16 so that should be a 14 okay right here so it looks like we're going from about a 7 to a 14 so a range of about a 7 to a, a, a 14 and you can see uh, that's about 7, I see. Now, you may say, well, this, this point D is less than halfway. Maybe you want to say that's a 15, okay, and this becomes an 8. So there is some room for wiggle room here. I look at this as a 7. Now, of course, 7, you best use the units, kilojoules. 
okay? But uh, the question gives you a plus or minus one, so um, an eight is what they say it is. Looks like to me it's a better close to seven, but a plus or minus one. So therefore, a seven to a, a nine is acceptable. Although I look at it as closer to a seven, uh, the, the answer is eight kilojoules. They don't, even, they don't have to write the unit. How nice is that? And it's plus or minus one. So again, I would have said looking at this as seven kilojoules, uh, but you had room to go seven, eight kilojoules, or nine. That's the range they give you to answer this question. Number 59. Explain in terms of heat of fusion, which is the amount of energy needed to melt a solid at its melting point, and the heat of vaporization, which is the amount of energy needed to vaporize a certain amount of liquid at its boiling point. Why the heat added during interval DE is greater than the heat added during BC. Okay, now again, you have to explain in terms of what they're asking for. So if you don't mention heat of fusion, heat of vaporization, you're going to lose your point here. So why is DE greater? Look at DE for a second here. All right, so if I change this up a little bit. So DE, all right, my line color is stuck. So look at DE here, and BC, you can see that DE is tremendously large compared to the other. Now why? Well, very simply, it takes a lot more energy to convert a what? A liquid to a gas than it does a solid to a liquid. Or you can say if it takes more energy, Look, and you can actually figure that energy, right, from 14 to about whatever that 54 mark is, okay, and you can figure out that energy, but certainly you would say that the heat of what? Vaporization has to be bigger than the heat of fusion, which is the energy you would calculate here. So for number 59, I would say in the answer booklet, the heat of vaporization is larger than the heat of fusion, or the heat of vaporization is 2260 joules per gram, and the heat of fusion is only 334 joules per gram for water. And this I'm getting, of course, from table B. All that information is listed for you if you had those questions. So table B clearly states that these values are so far different. So your heating and cooling curve should reflect that as well. Okay, number 60. So the next group of questions have these two little cylinders or I guess pistons or syringes, so to speak. I guess they're pistons, as they say, contains hydrogen gas. And we have an identical cylinder A and B. They, it contains methane gas. And so these are these diagrams. And they give us the information of pressure, volume, and temperature. Now, I notice right away that these containers are the same. So they're telling me that the gas, which is in here, is occupying the same volume. So I know that if the volume is the same and the pressure and temperature are the same, because of Avogadro's hypothesis, I know right away that they have the same number of molecules. So number 60, kind of given away, compared the total number of gas molecules in cylinder A to the total number of gas molecules in cylinder B. Obviously the same as pressure and temperature, which are the two variables that will affect how much space a gas will take up are the same, okay, then you know the volume will be the same. And you already learned that one mole at some point in your chemistry career, which is how many particles exist at STP, standard temperature and pressure, if we keep temperature and pressure constant and we compare two boxes, well, those two boxes will have the same number of particles. That's why we say a mole of gas particles will occupy 22.4 liters always. No matter what gas is in here, helium or hydrogen or methane, it will not matter. A mole of a gas will occupy this volume, but that only works if temperature and pressure are the same. We picked STP, standard temperature and pressure, for that case. So number 60 to the answer booklet we go. So the number of gas molecules is the same 
for both cylinders. You should mention both. And that's Avogadro's hypothesis. Number 61. State the change in temperature and the change in pressure that will cause the gas in cylinder A to behave more like an ideal gas. So we want to take this gas, which is a real gas, okay, and convert it to an ideal gas. I always think of a real student and an ideal gas. And what's my, my key here is um, the ideal student has no attractions for the other people in his classroom. He is just fixated and just want to learn everything he can from the teacher. Whereas real gases really have attractions between other students. So I want to take a real gas that really has attractions and I want to convert them to an ideal gas. So what can I do? Well, first of all, I want to take my pressure and I want to, as I go this way, to make it have no attractions. And again, real gases are, tend to be what? Close together. To make them ideal, you want them farther away to have less attractive forces. So I would decrease the pressure. And I would also, because by decreasing the pressure on the gas, by moving the cylinder up, they would have a chance to be farther away and have no attraction. So definitely, pushing the cylinder down would cause them to have more attractions and be more real. Now the temperature, I would want to increase the temperature so that the molecules move faster and if they move faster because temperature is the average motion or kinetic energy they would have less time to attract. So that's what I would do here. So you could say pressure decreases, temperature increases, or you could say Anything above 1.2 atmospheres, anything, uh, sorry, anything below 1.2 atmospheres, decrease it. Anything above 293. So in the answer booklet, I write higher or lower would be sufficient. Higher for the temperature, lower for the pressure. And so number 62. In the space in your answer booklet, okay, they want you to show a numerical setup for calculating the volume of the gas in cylinder B at standard temperature and pressure. So what you're going to do is you're going to take these values and you're going to set that up in your booklet. How would you set that up? Well we know that we have a gas law formula given to us in table T and magically table T is here and we scroll down to it says combined gas law, your only gas law and you've got pressure volume temperature in one condition equals pressure volume and temperature in a new condition except in this question there the new condition is going to be STP which is standard temperature and pressure so you have your current conditions which is the PV1 um, and T1 and your new the new condition which I sometimes call the future okay is standard temperature and pressure. Now I forgot what it was so I go to uh, another part of my reference table as we scroll all the way up to I believe table A we will see standard pressure and standard temperature given as 101.3 kilopascals, one atmosphere, 273 Kelvin or zero. Now of course you're never going to use zero in a gas law formula so you've got to use your Kelvins. Okay and depending upon what unit you started with depends upon what pressure unit you're going to use 101.3 kilopascals or the one atmosphere so back to the question alright so we've got our gas law formula in hand and now we're just going to try to put this together so we want to calculate the volume of cylinder B at STP so the current condition pressure is 1.2 atmospheres and what I'm doing is I'm using PV over T equals uh, PV over T. Now I might have I've, I've, so now this is the current condition so I've got my pressure is 1.2 atmospheres my volume is 1.25 liters and my temperature already in Kelvin for me very nice if it wasn't Celsius I'd have to convert I put my Kelvin here and then they want the what? They want the new um, 
condition at STP. So they're going to solve for the new volume, which would be the V, and make that a V, not an X, since I know it's volume. The atmosphere at table uh, A tells me that STP is going to be 1 atm. And of course, um, 273 is my new um, temperature. And that would be the answer. So you can write that into your, um, uh, you know, of course, writing it here is not going to help. You have to make sure you put that in your booklet. So here it is. And as weird as this may sound to you, all they want was this. In fact, although I shouldn't say this, uh, even if you didn't have the units, this would be acceptable. And you could put the uh, solve for V by itself and just put the numbers in. But this is all they wanted. They just wanted the setup only. So you're just plugging the numbers in, and they're giving you a point for this. Okay. If you didn't, if you left out the um, um, units, they would still accept it. Although we shouldn't, but they say it's okay. 63. All right. So 63 to 65 is based on this little chart here, with some organic chemistry questions. And 63 states identify the homologous series. So what the heck is a homologous series? A homologous series is a family of hydrocarbons that are the same based on their bonding. So if you go to table Q, which we will go in a second, we'll see the three different types of homologous series based upon the bonding to each of them, to each other carbon. In any case, identify the homologous series to which this isomers belong. So we can see that the bonding between all the carbons are single. So if I don't know what that is already, I'm going to go to table Q. So table Q gives me these homologous series. And what makes them the same series or family is the bonding between the carbons. So if the bonding between the carbons is a single bond, then we say that the uh, name of the family of hydrocarbons that has single bonds between the carbons are alkanes. All right, if they were double, they'd be alkenes. And of course, if there were triple bonds between the carbons, they'd be alkynes. But since we have single bonds in our pictures, they're alkanes. So again, here's my single bonds, all single bonds. So these are alkanes. So I would write alkanes. I guess they give you a big space if you want to write big. So this is all they require. Okay, alkanes. And of course, you're not limited to that. I guess you could also write the general formula for alkane, CNH. 2n plus 2, or I guess you could say single bonded hydrocarbons, anything that was associated because they say except the responses include but not limited to. So, but I think you should get out alkanes out of that, no problem. Number 64. Number 64 states write the empirical formula for isomer 1. Okay, well, it's isomer 1, and we should know that the empirical formula is the lowest ratio, right? Lowest ratio is for the empirical. So for isomer 1, let's go find the molecular formula, which is the actual number. So I'm going to make, get this out of my way here, and then count. OK, just changing the color because I can. And this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So I've got six carbons. So I'll make this C6. And then I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 and H14. Now I didn't have to really count because as you know alkanes have a general formula of double the amount of H's as compared to carbons in add 2. So 6 times 2 is 12 plus 2 is 14 because they have this formula. H, uh, CN, C is 2N, H2N plus 2. Alright now the empirical as I just said is the lowest ratio. So what's the lowest ratio? Well, cut the C3H7, I believe, is the lowest I can go. Okay, I just, I just cut everything in half. So this is your lowest ratio. So you can write C3H7 as that lowest ratio or the empirical formula. And they would not mark it wrong if you put the hydrogen first and the carbon first. I would, I would like to do that, but they don't. Okay, 65. Number 65 states... Explain in terms of intermolecular forces. Notice they're saying explain in terms of this statement, of this point we want you to explain in, why the isomer 2 boils at a lower temperature. All right, well, if something is boiling at a lower temperature, 
it's really because it must not need as much energy to separate amongst each other's molecules than it does for isomer one. See, the reason why number two is boiling is because this molecule is attracted to this same type of molecule. So if I've got this isomer in a beaker, there's many of these molecules next to each other that are the same. And they're attracting each other. And if it doesn't take much energy for you to separate them, into the gas phase, it must mean you have a lower boiling point. So this means that your attractive forces between the same molecules of number two must be lower than the attractive forces between this isomer and itself. This has a higher boiling point. This needs a lot more energy to what? Separate these molecules from themselves because their intermolecular forces of attraction are greater. Remember, table H had this very famous curves that went up, and we learned we had vapor pressure on one side, and we had um, temperature on the other. And we learned that when the, the vapor pressures equal this straight line, although it's not straight, the one with the higher what? The higher boiling point, which would be this, let's make this B, what had a higher boiling point because it resisted evaporation. Its vapor pressure curve, by the way, vapor pressure is nothing more than the force of the liquid escaping the gas, gas phase. So the vapor pressure was lower for the same temperature. And this B resisted evaporation, whereas let's say A, which could be um, number one here, let's make that one in our problem, make this isomer two. Isomer two is resisting evaporation. So its vapor pressure, although they're not mentioning it, is lower because the intermolecular attractions between these isomers and themselves are higher. Okay, any case, let's write that down. In 60, in the, so what I've written here in the answer booklet where your answers have to go is isomer 2 boils at a lower temperature because it has weaker intermolecular forces of attraction than isomer 1. Notice I'm, uh, uh, I'm basically talking about both of them. I'm answering the question in regards to how they want me to answer it. They wanted it to answer in terms of intermolecular forces of attraction. And it's a good idea to mention both. I'm mentioning isomer 2 and isomer 1. Do not say the forces of attraction are weaker or stronger without mentioning the uh, compounds you're talking about. I have to mark it wrong, even though I, I, I know that you know what the right answer is. Don't be lazy here. Be explicit about who you're talking about. So you notice I said or here. You can say the intermolecular forces in isomer 1 are stronger. You're talking about the forces, and you're mentioning isomer is stronger. Okay, That implies it's stronger than isomer 2. But if you said the, if you said the intermolecular forces in, are stronger, generally speaking, probably not going to be right. Stronger than what? Who's stronger? You have to be explicit. Number 66. All right, so number 66 through 69 was based on the information below and, of course, your knowledge of chemistry. What, of course? All right, well, any case, what I like to tell my students before you get yourself all confuddled and confused with all the information they're giving you, and some students do, they look at all of this and say, oh, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. I suggest, as a technique, as a strategy, read the question first and see what you need to get out of it, as opposed to trying to absorb it all and confuse yourself. 66. Identify one characteristic used by Mendeleev to develop his classification system of the elements. All right, so we're looking for a characteristic used to develop his classification system. Well, let's go into the um, uh, little blurb here. I call these the blurb. Uh, before atomic numbers are known, Mendeleev developed the classification system for 63 elements known in 1872 using oxide formulas and atomic masses. They just asked for what? A characteristics used to develop his classification system. So they said they developed a classification system for the 63 elements known at the time using oxide forms and atomic masses. So you could say oxide formulas or atomic masses. And if you look in the chart, don't they go in order of the mass? Here's the 1, here's the 7, here's the 9.4, 11. They're going in order of mass. And they're also going in some kind of order of his um, oxide formulas, his ability to react. 
Okay, so let's go to the answer booklet. And we could say, uh, basically, atomic mass. Or, I should put the mass there, right? So atomic mass is acceptable. Or you could say the what? The oxide formulas. All right, that's all that's necessary. Okay, right from the reading. Pretty simple. Number 67. In number 67, based on the oxide formula, what is the number of electrons lost by each atom in elements in group 3? All right, group 3, what do I have? I've got boron, aluminum, okay. I got some other elements here that were not so familiar. But if I knew nothing else, couldn't I just go to the periodic table and see what charge these become? Let's do that. So in this periodic table of elements, I see that boron likes to become positive 3 and aluminum likes to become positive 3. And the other ones listed, okay, if you notice, I think there might have been indium there. I'm not sure I forget now. But I definitely know that boron and aluminum are at the top of the list, and they both become positive 3. So positive 3 is our answer. Now, positive 3, I thought, was the answer, but that's why you've got to check to see what they're asking for. Easy to make a mistake. They want the number of electrons lost. So if aluminum becomes aluminum plus, zero, plus 3, that was what? 3 electrons were lost, or boron. So the answer is 3 electrons. Now, how else could I know that this is a a positive 3 for aluminum and boron besides the periodic table. Well, the R2O3 okay, um, oxide formula they give you could help. We know oxygen is negative 2 from the periodic table, negative 6 overall due to all the oxygens. So this thing has to equal 0. So this must be plus 6 overall for all of the elements listed. We'll call it R. Because there's two there to delivering the plus six overall, each one is individually plus three. So you could have done that from the oxide formula. Okay, starting knowing the oxygen's oxidation state is negative two, using what you've done for redox and determining the charges. Or, like I just did, went to the periodic table and saw that aluminum and boron both become plus three, which means they lose what? They lose three electrons. Because becoming positive means your charge is going up because you lost some negatives. 67 is lose three electrons. Since the question asked how much would you lose, they kind of gave that away. It wasn't as hard as I thought. All you needed was three electrons. And if you put the number three, they would accept that. Okay, number 68. Okay, based on table J, that's our list of uh, metal reactivities and nonmetals, list the... Identify the least active. It's important you read carefully. They put that in italics. Of course, if I go too fast, I would miss it too. Listed in group one. So we want the least active metal listed in group one of this uh, table here. So the least active metal, okay, from this list, it would be silver. We have cesnium, rubidium, copper, potassium, sodium, lithium, and hydrogen. And Silver would be the answer because, well, if we go to table J, I'll show you. So here we are with table J, and table J lists the most active metals, the ones that lose electrons the best, and I've just circled in blue all the elements listed in that group one for that uh, periodic table that was listed, lithium, rubidium, potassium, cesium, sodium. These are all active metals, and as we go down, they become least active, and there also was hydrogen, copper, and the one that I said was right, because I've been doing this for a while, is silver. Silver is the least active metal, and that's why silver is the answer. So we write silver. AG is fine, or the name of the element. Number 69. Number 69. Explain in terms of chemical reactivity. Again, you have to answer according to how they want you to. So they're telling you explicitly, answer in terms of chemical reactivity. Why the elements in group 18 on the modern periodic table were not identified by Mendeleev at the time. Okay, well, understandably so, he was using, of all things, 
atomic masses, and also what? He was using the oxide formulas of these compounds. So what you have to understand is that if it bonded with oxygen, if it had some kind of reactivity, therefore it would make what? It would make a compound with oxygen. So group 18 elements are the noble gases. They don't have any reactivity, so they don't make any oxide formulas, so to speak. That's not the entire truth, but good enough for this course. So if you didn't know that, let's go to the uh, periodic table. And you should know the noble gases are in group 18. You should know these are the halogens in group 17. These are the alkali metals in group 1. And these are the alkaline earth metals, the ones you need to know. But these are chemically inactive. The halogens are the most reactive nonmetals. The alkali metals are the most reactive elements, probably on the periodic table, but they are the most reactive metals. And the alkaline earth are the second most reactive metals. Any case, the noble gases, okay, here, you notice they don't have oxidation states, at least for the first um, couple of atoms. Okay, so they don't typically make any oxides because they don't react. And therefore, Mendeleev would not have been able to uh, identify them because he didn't see them in any oxides that he was using to classify his periodic table. So in the answer booklet, I say group 18 elements are mostly unreactive. And that is totally all you need for that answer. And of course, I added, and thus for no, there were no oxide compounds for Mendeleev to study. That could be another way to say it. There were no oxide compounds for Mendeleev to study. I just combined both. You didn't need to add this second part. These blue and red answers are two correct answers uh, by themselves. Okay? So many ways to say that, but generally speaking, the group 18 elements are unreactive. Good enough. Number 70. Okay, number 70 through 73 has this uh, chemical apparatus here. We're doing a chemical reaction. Again, I suggest before you read through this and look at this very, very carefully, look at the questions first. So many people will leave these part two questions blank because I don't know how to do this. It turns I'm so intimidated or I just get, I don't know what's going on. I get all befuddled as my word that I make up in these videos. Anyway, look at the questions first. The questions are all easy. They're pinpointing some parts of this. So look, you got all this laboratory set up and they give you this background. I'm not even going to read it. Let's go to the question first. You can see that it's very doable. Number 70 states, determine the change in oxidation number for the hydrogen that reacts. Well, Gosh darn it, if they didn't give you an overall reaction, that'd be difficult. You have to really think about how this works. But they gave you the entire reaction. So really, all of this above here really is mute for this question. So we want to do the change. Well, I know when hydrogen stands alone by itself, like any element, the protons equal the electrons, this is a zero. And then in water, I know that each oxygen is negative two negative 2 overall, the whole thing has to equal 0 for water. So this must be plus 2 for all the hydrogens. Because there's one hydrogen, each hydrogen must be plus 1. And I'll do that again if you didn't see what I did there. Okay, it's how I do it. I'm trying to find the individual charges. So what I do is I take the individual charge of 1, oxygen, which I know, is negative 2, and I get that from the periodic table. So oxygen is right there, negative 2. My hydrogen, which is located um, to the right of the periodic table, has two charges, plus 1 and a negative 1. So I use a negative 2 charge of the um, oxygen to do that. So in H2O again, here's how I'm going to do this. I take the individual charge of the oxygen, which I just found to be negative 2, there's only one oxygen in the compound, so it's negative 2 overall. The whole thing equals 0 because water has no charge. So this negative oxygen has to be offset by a positive 2 by all the hydrogens. Because there's two hydrogens, each hydrogen is plus 1. So the change in this reaction is from the 0 to the plus 1 in the H. So that is the change in the oxidation number. So from the zero that came from the hydrogen to the plus one that came from the water, right? That's how it worked. And you don't need to have these below, but that's what they were looking for. 
And obviously, if your charge went up because you lost electrons, you would say this is an example of oxidation. Okay? In any case, number 71. Number 71, write a balanced half-reaction equation for the reduction of the Pb plus 2 ions in this reaction. All right, let's clean this up a little bit. So we want the half reaction, okay? And it must be balanced. So I know that dealing with this, uh, let's make this smaller so I can write with it. PB is what charge? Well, we know oxygen is negative 2 here, so PB is plus 2. And it's going to a PB liquid, which is 0. Okay, so we know standalone elements are 0, as we have just done. H plus was positive, negative 2. So, so we're going to take PB plus 2, and we're going to go to 0. Let's do that right in the um, answer booklet. So we had our PB plus 2, which came from the PB or lead 2 oxide, negative 2, plus 2. And it went to PB liquid, which means it's standing by itself as a 0. So, we have balanced the lead. There's one lead on this side, one lead on this side, but we haven't balanced the charge. So, half reactions, you have to put the electrons in. And everyone gets confused here. I know there's a difference of two electrons because there's a difference of two charge. Where do I put those electrons? You put the electrons on the side so that both sides of a half reaction have the same charge. So, if I was to put two electrons here, which is incorrect, a negative 2 and a 0 gives me a total of a negative 2 on this side. This side is a total of a positive 2. These charges are not being balanced. You must balance the mass and the charge. So clearly the two electrons belong on this side. Plus 2 electrons gives me PB0. Now how does that work? How, how does a check work here? Well, we have a total of a 0 on the product side. And on this side, a plus 2 and a negative 2 also gives me 0. And this is showing reduction because my charge is going down because I'm gaining electron. Grr, gaining electrons reduction. They didn't ask for that, but it's nice to know the full concept as you do this. Number 72. Number 72 states, explain why the reaction that occurs in this glass tube cannot reach equilibrium. Now we see that in the reaction, we have a one arrow. Let's look carefully. Hydrogen gas reacts with the what? The lead oxide. That's a solid, right? That's your S right there on the bottom. So the H2s react with this. And what do they make? They make lead liquid, which is right here on this side. And they make H2 gas, which comes off of this, which apparently escapes with the H2. Now, because the gas is escaping, we say that the reaction is a completion reaction. When gases are leaving, okay, it's impossible for this gas to react with the what? The lead liquid. Let's clean it up. So the reversible reaction is impossible under these conditions because the what? The gas is what? The gas is leaving. We need the gas to be around to hit the lead to create the reverse reaction. So I wrote, the H2O gas is leaving the tube, thus it cannot react with the lead liquid to form the reactants. The bottom line here is that under these conditions it doesn't work because the reaction is, basically the Ford reaction is a completion reaction. And you are responsible for knowing that reactions reach completion, which means they keep going in one direction until you run out of the reactants because of one of two methods. One, you create a gas that leaves, or you create a precipitate, Okay, which means you create a solid that cannot, okay, give up its ions and go in the reverse. In this case, we were dealing with a gas leaving. So number 73, the final question on a, a group of questions that you can see didn't require you to completely understand the entire process up above here. Go to the question first. So number 73 states, state one change in the reaction conditions. Just one change. They're asking for one change. Okay, other than adding a catalyst that would increase the rate of reaction. Well, increasing the rate of reaction is a bunch of different things we can do. First of all, we're dealing with a solid. What if I increase its surface area by making it into a powder? You've talked about that. 
how about I increase the temperature so that they collide faster. If I make the gas go faster, it will collide with the solid faster. Temperature is motion, average kinetic motion. So if I increase the temperature, the number of effective collisions will increase. If I increase the surface area, I will expose more of the what? Lead oxide to the hydrogen um, gas, and I would increase the rate of reaction by increasing the number of collisions. Okay, so there's many things we can do here. What if we increase the concentration of the H2, make more H2 gas come in here, stuff it with higher pressure? That would also increase. So many, many answers here. Very simple. There's a rate of reaction question. Anything that you want to say rate of reaction way, um, way, you could do this. Increase the pressure. Another one of the H2. Any case, let's go to the answer booklet. Remember, the question stated only one rate of reaction factor. So increasing temperature would suffice or increasing the surface area by making PB into a powder or increase the concentration of H2 or increasing the pressure of the system. Okay, all of those would work. 74. So 74 through 77 is on this hall herolt process, which is what we use to extract pure aluminum from the earth using aluminum oxide. But this looks so what? It looks so complicated. Oh, I'm tired. And you're giving me this very complicated looking process. Oh, if I read this all, I don't know what's going on. I'm telling you people, don't get crazy about the blurb. Okay, this is a blurb. Okay, only go back after you read the question. I would not want you to read this entire thing and try to understand it. It may look too confusing. I do not want you to get intimidated. So to the questions we go and see what we need to know from this. And you'd be surprised how very little. 74, compare the chemical properties of a 300 kilogram sample of aluminum oxide liquid with a 600 kilogram sample of an aluminum oxide liquid. Huh? That's just mass. So if I have 300 kilograms of aluminum oxide, how would its chemical properties differ from a 600 kilogram? Well, mass is an extensive physical property. It has nothing to do with chemical properties. Mass is clearly a physical property. How much you have of it has nothing to do with what its chemical makeup of. What does have it to do is its chemical formula. The chemical formula is exactly the same. Even if this was a different phase, this would have no change. So 74, there's no difference because the chemical formulas are the same. So 74, both samples have the what? The same chemical properties. I didn't ask for why, but I mean, please. They have the same chemical formulas. Mass is not a chemical change. All right, 74. You can see after all of this stuff you see that could be confusing to you, that's a very, sim very silly, actually, and very easy question. Number 75. Okay, write the chemical name for the liquid compound dissolved in this liquid. Hmm, so I got to go back, because that you don't know off the top of your head. So we look and we see that right here, aluminum oxide liquid is dissolved in this. Okay, so careful with the question. If you write the chemical formula, I'm not sure they would, ex they would ex uh, uh, give that as correct. So they want the name, right? Write the chemical name. Be very, very cognizant. That means aware, okay, of what they're asking for. They want the chemical name. So this is an ionic compound. Of course, aluminum goes first. So aluminum, or for a word, aluminum, and then oxygen would be just oxide. We do not need a Roman numeral here for the stock system because aluminum, if you look on the periodic table, is only plus three. It doesn't have multiple charges. So aluminum oxide, name of an ionic compound, the metal first, and then you add IDE for the nonmetal, no matter how many you need. Okay? So aluminum oxide. So aluminum oxide is the answer. Remember, the name is what they're looking for. Number 76. 
And number 76, it says, what is the melting point of the substance? A substance, my friends, is an element or a compound at the bottom of the tank. So we've got to go back into the problem. And here's my tank, graphite line tank. And at the bottom, I see aluminum. So what they're really asking for is what is the melting point of aluminum? You don't know, know that off the top of your head? What is wrong with you? Of course, you have to go someplace to look. And table S is our friend. Let's go there. So table S gives us a bunch of different information, but of course it gives us melting point as well. Go find our aluminum, and it gives us 933 kelvins. And look at that, 933 kelvins, they even write the unit for you, okay? All that work right in units, so 933. Number 77. Okay, compare the density of the aluminum liquid with the density of the mixture of aluminum oxide and this, and this compound. Well, they want you to compare the densities with two things. So you can't just say one thing. So I know that the aluminum is at the bottom. I know that the aluminum oxide is dissolved in it. And so I know clearly I know that aluminum is more dense than the oxide and this sodium aluminum fluoride liquid because it settles to the bottom. That's the one point. This little arrow pointing down is showing this aluminum is going down to the bottom, and it must be more dense than what the other components are. It's the only way to separate these. We make pure aluminum at these electrodes, and it settles to the bottom. It's the only way it collects to the bottom is that it is more dense. So the density of the aluminum is greater than that of the aluminum oxide and. You notice I'm mentioning what? I'm mentioning both things. They want you to compare them to both. So if you don't mention both, you're not going to get the full answer. Okay? So I would think. Now, just looking at the, um, the answer booklet key here from New York State, they're accepting the density of aluminum is greater. So I guess I'm wrong there. So they would just accept that the density of aluminum is greater. So this is all you needed. But try not to be too short with your answers. Try to really um, be consistent in answering all the way through. In this case, they allowed just that. 78. So numbers 78 and 80 are based on the information below. And of course, I call this the blurb. Let's go to the questions before the blurb gets us. We don't want the blurb to confuse us, befuddle us, and intimidate us. Let's go to the questions. So 78. Determine the amount of energy released when 1.0 moles of sulfur trioxide is produced. Now, sulfur trioxide, sulfur with three oxygens, is produced, okay, so we're on the product side right here. These are the products. So when I produce sulfur, tri sulfur trioxide, this is how much energy is released. Now, you notice the co stoichiometric coefficient for every two sulfur tri oxides, there's 394 kilojoules, but they want it for one. So you can write this a couple different ways, but you know that if I have 1.00 mole of sulfur tri uh, SO3, and I know from the stoichiometric coefficient from two SO3s, they're what? There's 394 kilojoules. So essentially, I'm dividing in half. I don't like my setup here. I don't blame you. But for every two of these, there's 394. So all I have to do here is divide by two. This is the energy per two of these being produced. It's also the energy of one. O2 being what? Reacted and two of these being reacted. But they're asked about this guy. So 394, you've got your calculators handy. 394 divided by 2 gives me 197 kilojoules. Let's put that into our um, answer booklet. 197, they took care of the units for you. And in this conversion, we started with three significant units, divide by two, and got two, but they're not even looking at significant unit uh, figures here as well. So 78 is 197 kilojoules. Number 79. Write the chemical form for vanadium 5 oxide. Okay, well, they talk about it in this little blurb here, but uh, 
again, has nothing to do with the blurb. You can just do it with, uh, independently. What you need to know, though, is that the 5 means that vanadium is plus 5. Now, if you look at the periodic table of elements and look for vanadium, you'll see that it can be plus 5, okay, right here. So it makes sense that vanadium can be plus 5. You didn't have to do that. You can just trust the words, but it's nice to know where these things come from. So vanadium is plus 5. Oxygen, as you've been dealing with all year, is negative 2. Now, if you don't know that, you can look in the reference table up right hand corner. It'll just show that. And all we're going to do from this point forward is we're going to crisscross. Right? We're going to put 5 over here and the absolute value of the 2 come here. So we crisscross applesauce, so however you want to talk about it. But the bottom line is we have to make a chemical formula that's neutral. So we're going to have V, two of them, with five oxygens. V2O5. Now, if you want to make a check here, if each oxygen is negative 2, that means due to all the oxygens is negative 10 overall, this thing has to equal 0. So collectively, the vanadium has to be plus 10. And of course, every, there's plus 10 for two vanadium, so each vanadium is plus 5. So that works out, okay, that the whole thing does equal 0, doing it that way. All right, so to our answer booklet, we go. So V2O5, you should put the metal first and the non-metal second. However, okay, uh, if you do not, they also, exp uh, also um, will accept it. Now, in the word oxide, I forgot to mention, they said oxide, and oxide, of course, isn't a polyatomic ion. It's the IDE tells you that the, uh, this thing is binary. And binary compounds mean you just have two different elements. So when you have two different elements, a metal, non-metal, the non-metal is going to the ID ending. That's how I knew it was an oxygen. Okay, number 80. So number 80 states, on the labeled axes in your answer booklet, complete the potential energy diagram for the forward reaction represented by this equation. So the equation in the blurb, let's go find it. Clearly, party people, this is an exothermic reaction. And I know because the heat, the energy is on the product side, which means you're producing the energy. Okay. Also, exo means the heat is what? Exo is heat is exiting. Whatever works for you. How is it exiting? You're producing it. It's leaving. If your heat is on the reactant side, that means you're using it. You're reacting it. You need it to make the products. You're absorbing it. So clearly, this is the key here, that this is being what? Released, and you must draw a what? An exothermic potential energy diagram. So if it's exothermic, we start with the reactants, we have our energy barrier, and then we go down lower. Here is our reactants, here is our products, and you, all you needed to do was to show that the line, I think, was going down, although you should show an energy barrier. So let me go back to that, sorry. So again here, and then coming down, your reactants, or I'm sorry, your products here, your final resting place, Okay, should be lower than your reactants. You don't have to label them, but you should show a line that ends up lower with a energy barrier, right? And if we, you know, got into a little more details, which I wish the question would do, we would know that the difference between where you start and where you finish, the difference between the potential energy, okay, uh, of the products and the reactants, or the difference of where you start and finish because it goes down, is a delta H that's negative. 394 kilojoules. And I'm doing negative to show that drops. So all this information we could add, all they wanted to see is a line that kind of ends downward. Number 81, 82 have this blurb. Okay. I go to the question. In your space in your answer, draw the structural form of Freon 12. Well, yeah, you probably would not know what that is. And if you did, uh, interesting person you must be. Uh, any case, Freon-12, they tell you in the blur, consists of one carbon atom, two chlorine atoms, and two fluorine atoms. Okay, so two chlorines and two fluorines. So here we go to the answer. So you're probably a good guess that the carbon, okay, in this Freon-12 is going to be in the middle because it can bond to what? Four different ones. Carbon makes what? Four valence electrons. 
equally spaced apart in a tetrahedral. That's the VSEPR theory that you may have learned. And then we have uh, chlorine, which has what? Seven, like all halogens. And I said two chlorines, so I'll just put them there. And this chlorine, like the all others, have seven valence electrons. And then we have fluorines. And they also, being in the same group, group 17, have seven valence electrons. And this fluorine has seven valence electrons. And of course, I'm getting them from the periodic table. Now, I could write it this way. This is totally fine. Or they accept it to be written this way. Uh, carbon with uh, the two Fs and the two Cls. Now, for those purists out there, I think you should show the lone pairs, but they're saying that this is fine, none the, none the same. Okay? So this is totally fine. Of course, you can have the two Cls any places around the carbon. It won't matter as long as you sh have the carbon showing four bonds and showing the halogens, okay, having, what, one bond. Okay? So there's the four bonds of the carbon, and each halogen has one, and every one, of course, is satisfying their octet. So whether you draw out all the electrons like I did, this is carbon satisfying its octet, and here is each chlorine satisfying its octet, and each, I should say, each halogen here. Okay, so as long as you do that, remember a dash is a pair, 82. 82, to which class of compound, organic compounds does freon 12 and freon 14 belong? Well, freon 12 we just drew, and freon 14 consists of one carbon and four fluorine atoms, but these are halogens, okay, halogens attached to a carbon chain. So when you have certain type of atoms attached to a carbon chain, they make functional groups. Let's go to table R to see what that is. So here is table R, and these are the functional groups. These are the groups of what? Nonmetals attached to a carbon chain, it changes the and drives, I should say, the um, chemical properties of the hydro or the, of the carbon chain. In any case, we had what? We had halogens. We, in this case, we had fluorine and chlorine, but it could have been bromide and iodine. These are in the group 17 elements. And the general formula is the rest of the carbon chain. It could be some other number of C's, okay, with an X attached. And here's an example chlorine attached to some carbons. So this is called a halocarbon or a halide. So halide or halocarbon is what we call these, number 83. Okay, last three questions. We've got our what? We've got our blurb. So let's go to the question and see what we've got here. Explain in terms of the polarity, okay, explain in terms of what they want you to explain in of sugar molecules, why sugar dissolves in water. I don't need any of this here to explain me why sugar dissolves in water because I know that if something dissolves in water, I know that like dissolves what? Dissolves like. So they must have similar or the same attractive forces. So water is polar and therefore sugar must be polar. Or water has H bonds and sugar must H bond with water. So now they're saying in terms of polarity, so all I want to say is that they both must be polar to be like, dissolves like, to follow that uh, dissolving rule. So I put both molecules consist of polar molecules. Many ways to say that, but they both are polar, therefore like dissolves like. You know, you don't need this schematic drawing. If you want to call it a schematic, it's just a drawing. Uh, but the negative part of one polar molecule, like the sugar, could attract the positive part of another water, another molecule like water. And so we could have the sugar interacting with the water in this way they will dissolve each other and get inside each other's inside each other's space in the solution. Whereas you know that fat or oils being nonpolar do not interact with what? Water. Because well, they don't really have a positive or negative end, so water has no real attraction to them. That's sort of the explanation. Of course, they they have LDF forces, but we'll talk about that in another course. Okay? Number 84. Number 84 states, determine the concentration as expressed by percent by mass of sugar dissolved in the mixture 
in step one. So now they're forcing me to go into the blurb. Here I go. Hope I come out. Okay. Any case, step one. Um, into the blurb I go. In a saucepan, mix the sugar and water. All right. And then keep uh, stirring until it all. So we have just mixture of sugar and water. Keep heating until it all dissolves. So just have sugar and water. And I know there's 414 grams of sugar. And I know that there is 177 grams of water. Now I add, I'm going to add these two together because this is going to equal my total, my total amount of mass. Now because they ask for percent by mass, a percent by mass is a part over total times 100. If you don't know that, a good place to look is table T. And table T shows you, my friends, in chemistry that a percent composition, we have a mass of the part over the mass of the whole times 100. So I want to find the whole mass of the solution, which is going to be the solute, substance being dissolved, sugar, plus the solvent, the water. So what I'm going to do is take my uh, part that they're asking for. They want in the question... Determine the concentration as percent by mass of the sugar. So they're asking specifically of the part that's the sugar. And if I go into my question, there's 414 grams of sugar. So that's my number on top, 414 grams of sugar. Now the total mass of my solution is going to be the sugar plus the water. Those are the total components. So I do 414 plus 177, and I get 591 as my total mass times by 100, and I get a percentage. So 414 divided by, five, by 591 times 100, and I get about 70%. Part over total, 84. 70%. Significant figures are not part of this, although I would argue that percentages don't have significant figures, however. Uh, number 85, explain in terms of the concentration of sugar molecules. They are asking you to explain in a certain way, so make sure you think about that in terms of the concentration of sugar molecules. While the boiling point in the mixture in step three increases as water evaporates from the mixture. Now, we really don't need to go to step three, but we'll read it anyway. Continue boiling the mixture until the temperature reaches 143 at standard pressure. Now, you boil... The mixture, we know that mixtures retain their what? Individual properties, so the water still is going to boil off. It's not bonded to the sugar, it's just attracted to it, so it'll boil off and leave the sugar behind. So what's happening is the sugar molecules are going to increase in concentration as we boil off the water. And you should know, as you have more what? Concentration of your solute, the freezing point, I'm sorry, the boiling point, okay, is elevated. So clearly, in terms of the concentration of sugar molecules, the concentration goes up because the water is leaving. Therefore, it, it raises the boiling point because of the effect that these molecules have on the water. As I have told you, maybe your teacher, if you have water, okay, and you have solute particles that are in the way of the water, they lower the vapor pressure but make it harder for the water to evaporate so you need a higher heat so therefore the boiling point is elevated because of the lowered vapor pressure but in any case you should know that solute particles in water increase the boiling point lower the freezing point remember that thumb thing I did that famous uh, the boiling point goes up the freezing point goes down okay so I said an increase in sugar concentration due to the boiling off of the water elevates the boiling point, okay? And that is the last question, okay? And I hope you got something out of that and hope you understand that when you're doing these part twos, these questions are as easy as the multiple choice. Even though the question's not there, they're asking the same concepts. And don't be intimidated by these blurbs, okay? Beat the blurb down, okay? And see that the questions are sometimes have nothing to do with the complications or how complicated the blurb looks like. They're just easy questions. 
given from these types of diagrams. Hope that helped.